All right, welcome back now to our fourth session of the day. Um, in this session, Frederick Godding, the head of AI at ChatLayer, will talk us about how GPT-3 works and the role and its role uh, in conversational AI. I'm personally looking forward to learn more about it. So, Frederick, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, I want just to re remind the the audience that to ask any questions you might have for Frederick, Frederick so he can answer uh, them at the end of his presentation. But welcome and over to you, Frederick. Thanks, Claudia. So there is a slide, right. So hi, everyone. So um, yeah, as Claudia said, I'm uh, heading AI at ChatLayer and so I've uh, been in chat layer for more than four years by now. So I've seen, have seen a lot of involvement in the chatbot space and in the natural language processing in the AI space. And so like a couple of years ago, two years ago, like uh, this uh, nonprofit called OpenAI released this fancy, huge um, AI model called GPT-3. And so it gave some stellar results and it makes people wonder, of course, what can we do with this GPT-3 in conversational AI? And if it's so nice and so natural and so human, would we maybe be able to pass the Turing test? So the Turing test is, I will dive deeper in that later in the presentation, but in short, it's a way of defining if a machine is intelligent uh, or not. So, Next slide. Right. So quickly about me. So I've been into um, nat natural language processing, speech recognition, conversational AI for already more than uh, 10 years. First, I did a PhD in this topic. Uh, then I briefly worked at uh, Amazon Alexa. And then, like I said, I joined Chatlier uh, four years ago when it was still a very uh, small startup. And so often the goal of um, a chatbot platform is to give such a good experience to users through a chatbot or help uh, people that use our platform, give such a good user to their users of the chatbot uh, that it seems like they're talking to a human. And this is what is a little bit what the Turing test is about. So like in the fifties, this famous mathematician, Alan Turing, he said like, look, how can we actually say that uh, a machine is intelligent? So, and then he thought like, well, um, say that, um, that me as a human wants to have a conversation and I do this through text messages. So I don't see the op opposite side. If this opposite side starts uh, sending text messages back to me, if I'm not able to distinguish a human from um, from a robot anymore, then we could say that if it was a machine that was answering, and I don't know if it was a machine or a person, then we could say that the machine is intelligent and mimics uh, human intelligence. So it has been some kind of quest in some sense for people that build chatbots to, to mimic this, this uh, intelligence and pass the Turing test. So one um, model that claimed that it could surpass a bit like this, this human capabilities and fool people into um, thinking that it was intelligent or human was actually GPT-3. So GPT-3 was released like two years ago. And it was a, like a very general purpose AI model that worked with text. And that although it wasn't trained for a specific task, it could do all kinds of tests. So you could ask it questions about certain facts, like uh, what's the human life expectancy in the United States or what is Singe? And it could really could not come up with the correct answer. Like Singe is a cloud communications platform into messaging and video and so on. Okay, you would say fact questions, easy. Probably they, they learned a lot of facts by heart. Uh, but then you could also teach it like very specific tasks like here, um, I want uh, to extract airport codes from uh, text messages. And so the only thing I told GPT-3 was like, look, extract the airport codes from this text. I give you an example. So I send this in full text to GPT-3. 
And then I give it uh, a new sentence. I want to fly from Brussels to Paris. And then it actually came up by itself, like, okay, the airport codes for Brussels and Paris are Bru and Bar. Not only tasks are very like uh, nice defined task, it can also be quite creative. So um, here uh, the task is to write product ads. And so I asked uh, GPT-3, could you write me creative ads uh, to run on Facebook? Here's the product description. And then it came up with like this nice description uh, for an ad that we could run on Facebook. And if you look at the text, you also see that although I didn't say that chat layer was a chatbot platform, it really converted or used that word chatbot inside um, the, the ad. So you see like with chat layer, you can create chatbots that are realistic, natural, and engaging. And there are many more of these type of tasks that you can do with uh, GPT-3, like another creative one is maybe um, converting a movie to emojis, like the title of the movie or summarize a document into uh, the level of a second grader, or more like these kind of developer uh, tasks, like translate natural language in an SQL query that you can run on a, on a database. So what so many different like applications you can do with it. So what is this GPT-3 now? So it stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And so in the next few slides, I will dig into the separate words uh, or the, that contain are contained in this acronym like generative pre-trained and transformer. So a transformer model is actually um, just uh, a name for a fancy huge neural network uh, that was invented like in 2017. So you see an image on the right. So neural networks well, forced a lot of AI breakthroughs in the last 10 years. And this particular architecture uh, is now what everybody is using. So on the right, you see some inputs, you see some output, and then in the middle, you see uh, several layers. And the middle block, actually you have it multiple times, 10 to uh, 20 times in, in practice. So, but it is like this very good neural network architecture that we then use to actually um, generate the next word in a sentence. So take the example here, say I start with authentic conversation start, and then we ask, or well, we train in this case, a transformer to predict or generate the next word, which in this case is here. So uh, we teach actually a transformer to predict the next word or the next sentence and so on. And we do this for a lot, but a lot, a lot of data. So, G so the people of GPT-3, they scraped the internet, uh, they scraped Wikipedia, they took a lot of uh, books and they all gave this to this transformer model and said, look, uh, here's the beginning of the sentence. This is now the next word you need to predict. Please learn how you need to predict uh, that next word. And then, so by doing that, actually the transformer model uh, learned how language works. And so how sentences are constructed, which words follows and another word, which kind of sentence follows the next sentence. And also even much further, like say I give you uh, almost a complete document and I ask you to complete the last paragraph, then actually this transformer model would be able to so you're like, well, this article is about this subject, it has these keywords. Well, I, I will now generate the conclusion uh, for this article. So in a nutshell, uh, GPT-3 actually has three important, com uh, there are three things that made this possible. So on the one hand, it was this transformer architecture, uh, this very good neural network architecture that we gave a lot of data. So a lot of data that we uh, got from the internet, but then we also needed a lot of compute, of course, to process uh, that data. So you're thinking about thousands of computers or servers that are processing the data uh, at, at the same time to uh, learn this very fa fancy and advanced um, AI uh, model. And to give you an idea how, on how big this should have been, the total cost for running um, 
or training this GPT-3 model is estimated to be around 10 million US dollars, which is quite a budget, uh, to, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so, right, they did it for us. So now we can see, uh, we can start using it. So we have this transformer model that was trained on a lot of internet data. So now we can just ask it to do some other tasks like extracting those airport codes. So we give it like, again, this, the instructions, an example, and then um, um, we give it a new sentence. I want to fly from Brussels to Paris. We give it to the transformer and it predicts um, or generates the, the, the airport codes for Brussels and um, Paris. So say now we saw it, how it can do all these fancy different tasks, but well, most of us are here are also interested in what can it mean for chatbots? What can it mean for conversational um, AI? So, well, you can also have a conversation with GPT-3. So here, well, there are actually two types of chatbots we need to consider. So we have the chit chat kind of chatbots. It's like I'm talking to my friend about very common uh, subjects, or you have more these task-oriented chatbots. Um, these are the ones that most people uh, have, uh, most of our customers have built on chat layer. They're there to, to help users fulfill a certain task, like buy something or report a problem and so on. So here you see an example of a, a, a chit chat conversation I had with uh, GPT-3. So I'm like, hey, what you've been up to? And then GPT-3, my friend, uh, answers, well, I've been watching some old movies. And then the conversation goes on. And at a certain point, you see like, okay, I asked like, who played in it? And then he said, well, I don't really uh, remember. And then um, I ask like, should we uh, watch it together? And then I get more like this kind of uh, like, closed answer like sure that would be fun and then i ask another question like how is lila doing by the way and well it answers with the same person so it was able to use that but also a very generic uh, answer i get back but if you look at the conversation from a first standpoint i mean all sentences are grammatically correct the conversation goes nicely forward so actually the quality is is, is pretty high for um, this chit-chat conversations. Of course, well, it's generating uh, text automatically. So I didn't tell uh, GPT-3 what he could talk about or what kind of replies he could give. So, I mean, um, for example, there are more sensitive topics than like talking about movies. Say, say just say to GPT-3, like, um, well, I had a bad day at the office. And then the moment I start talking about the pharmacy, he starts already giving me suggestions on medicine I, I, I could start using. And you can imagine if this conversation goes further, well, it, it could go in any direction. And that's probably getting a bit more dangerous. It's also a bit, it's also known actually that uh, GPT-3 sometimes can become a bit racist and, and so on. So, I mean, the moment you're like, um, yeah, you're not, you're using GPT-3 without any safeguards, then it can talk actually about anything to you and maybe it will nudge people in wrong directions. So the other type of bots we had are the task-oriented chatbots, as I mentioned. So I was wondering like, okay, could we use GPT-3 for um, like solving a certain task for me? So, well, let's try to uh, be like a Proximus assistant. Uh, so Proximus is the biggest um, telco in Belgium. So they have all kinds of subscriptions and one of them is the flex pack. So I asked them like, ask GPT-3 like, well, I want to buy the flex pack. flex pack. What's the price? And then I just said the price is ten dollars but well actually it's 419 49.99 a month so it's like a subscription so it didn't know that and okay it doesn't maybe know doesn't know what proximus is but it clearly illustrates like well if it doesn't know something like it doesn't know the price or anything probably because it never saw the price then it starts making up things 
the same next I asked Proxim is like, okay, but I want to buy a pack of Coca-Cola. Well, they don't really sell Coca-Cola to their customers, but um, GPT-3 didn't mind. It also said like, well, the price of Coca-Cola is uh, $1.99. So, well, you could, you could always find excuses why it didn't do that, but it points to a general problem that for GPT-3, it's very difficult to work with knowledge that it doesn't have, or it could be knowledge that is maybe available on a website, but it just didn't, have, didn't see, or it can be like this typical knowledge that is in backend APIs of companies that is not widely available um, on the web. And so that's for me, one of the more practical drawbacks of using something like GPT-3 as the engine for powering a chatbot. There's no good way of incorporating um, uh, external knowledge in a practical way. And even if you could find a way, it's also not very uh, scalable. So this is also something OpenAI acknowledges as their uh, limitations is that, well, despite that the quality of the conversation is really high, there's still a chance that you get some toxic or biased outputs and it can make up um, facts. So I believe that, well, you saw the impressive results that GPT-3 can produce, like it can really answer like common knowledge questions of have chat, but chit chat conversations, but especially for answering like more the fact based questions or helping people out. I think that chatbots are actually the new search bars and that they should be able to uh, work with this kind of this kind of external knowledge and these backend APIs. What you really want is to go to a website and just ask your question. And even if it's not stored somewhere in, in, in the chatbot, it should be able to retrieve it, for example, by searching on, um, on the website. So I also imagine that one day, um, yeah, the way we see Google or use Google today, that we get a list of 10 possible answers that in the future, that won't be the case anymore. And we just easily get the answer sent to us. So what, so to make that possible, we probably need to uh, also be able to browse the web to find uh, new answers or answers that we don't know or find ways to work with or backend it APIs in an automatic way, the GPT-3 uh, way. And something I'm uh, really excited about like is this new uh, model called ACT. And this ACT model is actually able to really surf on websites to um, answer um, a, a certain um, question. And I think this could actually help or be a piece of the puzzle in making uh, fully fledged uh, GPT like chatbots possible in the future. So here's a demo of um, that act model by the company called adapt and they show like you so what you will see is that you'll see that a question is typed to find a certain home and actually it's not that this model works with like extracting entities like the price and so on and filling it in the website no it really learned how to browse a web browse the website and based on the fields fill those fields in so so as you can see here the question is typed and it's submitted and automatically the bot added, adds it in the search field. Now it adds the max price. So 600K that the house can be, the number of beds that are needed and voila, it then shows like, here you have a house that's within your budget. And um, yeah, that uh, that is for four people in Houston. So this is probably a way how, or a way how we can in the future enable usage of um, external uh, knowledge. So to summarize, so GPT-3's pros are that like it can um, answer questions, it can have conversations, it can, you can give it a task and just give it one example and it will be able to come up with a sensible um, answer. Also, the quality of the conversations is really high. I have 
I couldn't find in any of the tests that I did a grammatical error actually in the text that they generated. So the quality is super high. On the other hand, you don't control the generation. So it could be that, well, the conversation goes in a certain direction that you don't want it to go, or that um, it starts outputting more like yeah, violent uh, content. Also, it only um, typically knows the general knowledge. And although you could teach it some specific knowledge, to me, it, today, it's not really practical usable for um, working with backend uh, systems and so on. And yeah, also one uh, caveat is that, well, today it's only available in English, of course, in the future um, that will change, but today it's only in English um, available. All right, so that brings us back to um, the question, will we be able to pass the Turing test? So, well, in my opinion, um, if it's like a normal chit chat conversation at the first sight, yeah, I wouldn't be able to see if this was a, a human or um, a robot talking where, to which I'm talking. But then like when you start analyzing the conversation a bit or you start asking questions that it doesn't know, I think it easily falls uh, true. So, well, that's that's my presentation. So now I have um, time for taking some um, questions. Awesome. Wow, very cool, actually. Um, thanks for, for sharing all this uh, insights and in a very interesting topic with us, Frederick. Um, yes, there are, um, I think, a couple of questions. So the first one would be, can GPT-3 be prevented from making up answers like it did in Proximus, in the Proximus example? Um, yes. Um, well, there are two ways of doing this. So um, in my opinion, so one way, we always give instructions at the beginning on like, what is the task about? And the people that want to do more advanced use cases, then they will really uh, give examples. Like this is the only things you can do with this chatbot. And then typically you, you push it a bit away from generating things that do not make sense. The other way of um, avoiding is, is to have like some kind of additional detection mechanism um, to say like before you send the information to the user, like uh, block it and say like, well, uh, we can't, cannot answer this type of question. I detected that this is a no ghost subject, for example. And so we, we say, I didn't understand uh, your question or you should go to the website. Um, and that's something GPT-3 does for violent content at the moment already. Uh, like they have some safeguards in place, but they are also not uh, bulletproof. It's like sometimes things slip uh, through. So. Understood. Um, cool. And next question actually uh, from Alja Major. Um, is it possible to improve existing NLU models with the learnings from GPT-3? Um, with the learnings, um, well, one thing we, I, then I'm thinking more in terms of applications is that I think GPT-3 could be a good way for, uh, teaching like our existing, um, chatbots, how, well, to, we are bots could, our chat layer bots could maybe talk with GPT-3 and like practice conversations, or we could use GPT-3 to maybe generate like alternative uh, training data. So today, one of the bigger problems we have uh, for or that our clients have is that um, they always need to come up with a lot of training expressions for an intent. So yeah, GPT-3 could help us also here to maybe generate alternative um, training expressions based on a couple of uh, input training expressions. So that are ways that GPT-3 uh, could help us, for example, making our current uh, bots uh, better. Yeah. Um, Frederick, you're having actually a couple of more questions. Um, 
So Michelle Pors said, are there ways to come around or improve GPT-3's outputs? Um, yeah, I think that that comes uh, back a bit to, to one of the previous questions where I talked about um, how you can prevent it from doing uh, certain things. So um, again, you can like, like we can give it like one example and instruction, you can give it more examples on what the answers should be to certain questions. And in that way, you nudge it again into um, improving the quality of the output. So rather than letting GPT-3, like giving it no clue on how to answer a certain question, you already teach it a bit by giving it examples like, well, typically uh, if you get that type of question, the answer should look something like this. And then that way you would improve the quality of the outputs of GPT-3. Uh, Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Floris Tudenborg said, first of all, thanks for the presentation you just showed. Um, the, yeah, you just showed us a user case with a map for houses. Could you use the chatbot and integrate it with, for example, a car configurator? Um... Well, there are multiple aspects, I think, to, to uh, the question. If you're just talking about like the use case, could we have something like this for uh, a car website, the car configurator? Then I think you could really build an end-to-end an -end experience for your website where you would talk to a chatbot and then the chatbot just knows this is a car configurator. So whenever a person asks like, change the color to red uh, for my car, then we could have just like uh, some kind of uh, instruction to the website uh, on the client side that just does that specific action on the website. So that's, I think, definitely possible with today's technology. So the example I showed in the presentation, there it was more about like on a higher level, like actually, um, we didn't program it to um, to actually um, um, like um, uh, fill in a, a house price. No, the model just learned by seeing what you were doing, what the human was doing on the website. So it's they observed like a thousand humans like um, um, that um, are like doing these kind of queries on a house website. Like um, I want to buy a house of three hundred k. I want to have a house at the swimming pool and they just visually checked how people were actually um, um, doing these type of actions on websites and that way they learned how to navigate websites so there it's more about a general model for navigating uh, websites so that's why it's a bit further in the future but the use case of having a chatbot to manipulate a car configurator is i think something we could already do today um, perfect um, we have time for one more. I'm really liking the, the, the questions that they are asking. So if that's okay with you, Frederick, I will read the last one. Uh, from yeah. Ferry Jacobs, uh, can you make GPT-3 predict actual intents by giving it enough input-output pairs, meaning question intent pairs, or will it still generate random content? Um, well, um, I'm thinking how to interpret the question, but uh, <laughs> um, so, well, if, if you just want to use it for intent classification as such, I think you can indeed just give it um, um, a lot of input examples and then um, an intent label and from then on use it for classifying um, intents. I think that's definitely uh, possible. And now we're, I'm thinking if input output pairs also means like uh, replying because I see or, or will still generate random content. Um, so that's not 100% clear to me. I'm, I'm, I'm also not sure if I, I know the answer to that question, if it then would still <laughs> generate random uh, content. But if it's just like for predicting intents, then it's another task and it's not specifically a chatbot anymore. It's just like, well, here you have five examples on how to book a train ticket. This is the intent. And I mean, from then on, this is what GPT-3 does for you, predicting um, intents. 
Good. So, um, Frederick, I want to thank you very, very much for, for your time, for your presentation and for sharing your knowledge about this topic with us. It's been great and it's been very interesting. Um, at least for me, it was it, it yeah. was super interesting. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Anyway, uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll see you in the in the networking session um, in a bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there. And it was really a joy actually to make this presentation because I was really enjoying to <laughs> to, to work with this uh, new technology and, and how we can leverage it. So yeah, it was fun. <laughs> thanks, Frederick. See you in a bit then. Bye bye. Now we're going to have a, a lunch break of 90 minutes. And between that break, we will, um, we will have an optional networking session for you to join. It will last around an hour or it will be open from 12.45 and, um, and 1.45 um, for you to be able to connect with the speakers and with other attendees as well. So I think it's a great opportunity if, if you reach to join us and uh, to, to meet you there. Um, I hope you can join and see you there. Bye.